Welcome to a second video on parallel chord truss analysis of cantilevers solved in multi-frame. We're going to look at a 24 square bay truss with two six bay cantilevers, one at each end, and a 29 square bay truss with two six bay cantilevers on each end. We're going to solve these in multi-frame. They have been previously solved uh, by the longhand method, um, and we're going to verify the results and demonstrate that we can use this alternate method of multi-frame to do that uh, truss solution. So these are the um, truss configurations. In this case, we have a total of 24 square bays, a six bay cantilever on each end, and you'll notice that the long diagonals are oriented in a manner that's going to produce tension in those diagonals. We're also going to look at the 29 square bay truss with two uh, inverted six bay trusses. So we've basically generated the six bay, um, 29 bay version, except we've inverted all of the uh, webs. So now we're going to end up with compression in these diagonals, tension in the vertical web members. The solution is independent of scale, so we can choose any scale we want. We're gonna set it up with the bay size being one foot by one foot. Uh, feet is the standard units that we're gonna use for member lengths. Member cross-sectional properties will be in inch units. We must specify member sections. Um, this is not crucial that we pick the right section because we're not looking at the self weight of the members and we're not addressing stress at this point. We just want to calculate what the forces are. Um, so in setting up the truss, we're going to align the truss length in the direction of the global X axis. And this is just for ease and comparing solutions. Um, the following measures are crucial to make sure that you're analyzing truss with proper pin joints so that you compare the multi-frame output to hand analysis using a system of two force members. You're going to put a hinge joint at one support, so you're going to restrain X, Y, and Z. You're going to restrain rotation about X to keep it from flopping over and rotation about Y to keep it from wagging around. But you're not going to restrain the rotation about Z because in the original analysis, you assumed pin joints there relative to uh, Z rotation. At the other end, we're going to put the same restraints, except that we're not going to uh, restrain X, um, because if we do that, then the supports will be um, altering the behavior of the truss and not allowing the bottom cord of the truss to play its proper role in providing the support. You're going to make sure that you specify appropriate member end releases that will assure that multi-frame computes forces corresponding to a pure truss. And as we get into it, I'll explain why it's end releases rather than a whole bunch of pin joints that you're using. Okay, so we're going to go open up multi-frame. It'll look something like this. Yours will look a little different because I've removed a bunch of these toolbars up here that are not things we're going to be using, and I don't want to clutter up my space too much <clears throat> so that the image of the truss can be larger. So I want to refresh your memory that we have uh, multiple windows here, which we can either get at through this uh, menu or we can get at them through these icons. So here's the frame window where you put in the geometry and you set the sections and apply restraints. Here's where you're going to apply loads. And then after your analysis, you're going to be able to view plots of important things such as internal moment, internal axial forces, internal bending stresses, uh, internal axial stresses, and so forth. Um, that data will also be presented in tabular form in the results window. And then also, if you're interested in the data in the tabular form, uh, you can go to the data window, which will tell you all sorts of uh, 
file information about the structure that you've input to the system. For architecture students, though, we tend to stick in the graphic mode. So we're going to look at the frame window. We're going to look at the loads window and look at the plot window because that will give us information in graphic form, which is typically more uh, meaningful to architecture students in terms of visualizing structural behavior. Now we're in currently the 3D window. We can go to this window, which is looking straight on at the X, Y plane. We can go to this window where we're looking at the Z, Y plane. Uh, we can go to the plan view or the 3D view. By the way, I remind you that Y is up in all structural analysis programs. And by the way, the structural analysis programs were created before the existence of our CAD programs. And when the CAD programs came along, they decided that CAD people draw primarily in the, in the horizontal plane. So they made the horizontal plane X and Y, and then Z became the third dimension. But in the structural world, people tend to analyze or draw, first of all, in a vertical plane. So the original software was in the XY plane where Y was up. And then when they added the third dimension, Z became another horizontal dimension. Uh, one of the things that you have to keep straight is that when you export something from multi-frame to another program or go in the other direction, the building will come in on its side and has to be rotated to put it in the proper orientation in the new coordinate system. In other words, all the Y coordinates in multi-frame that are the vertical coordinate in multi-frame they will become a horizontal com uh, coordinate in some other software to which you might import exported files from multi-frame. So I'm in the 3D view. The reason I like that is because there's a way that I can arrange it so that in the 3D view, we don't inadvertently drag things around. We don't have that option in any of these other orthographic views, not the front view, the right view, or the top view. Um, and by the way, if you ever want it, you can go down here and pick a left view, a right view, a rear view, a front view, and so forth. But typically, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to bother with that. We'll just live with these icons up here. But sometimes that extra capability is useful. Okay, so if I'm in this, any of these orthographic views, multi-frame automatically allows you to drag or nudge any joint and any member in the drawing. Um, typically, you don't want to have that capability because you can double click on something and inadvertently nudge it in some direction that you don't want it to go in. So we're going to stick in the 3D view when you load up your software, you may discover the following. I'm going to go to Edit, Preferences. I'm sorry, this is not on your screen. But I go to Preferences. I go to View. And here there's a little category called Mouse Behavior. And you'll notice you have the option to check this where you can drag nodes in 3D or check this where you can drag elements in 3D. Generally speaking, you do not want to be doing that. Um, so I have these unchecked. It's quite likely when you open your software for the first time, they'll be checked. And my advice is you uncheck them because one of the most common things that drives students crazy is they'll be double clicking on members and they'll move a member a little bit and they don't even realize they've done it. But it's just enough to throw all their results off, which of course is very frustrating because you're always looking for the right numbers so that you can check for consistency with your hand calculations. So I strongly encourage you to unclick those two and to work in 3D. Okay, so in, in 3D, we often want to have a frontal view and we can do that in the following way. We can come over and grab this handle and we can tilt it up until we're looking horizontal and then we can rotate with this handle. And now we are staring down the Z-axis 
we're staring straight on to the XY plane and we can draw just as if we were in that plane but we are still officially in the 3D view and as long as we have these handles along the side we know that so we're in a view where things are not going to get uh, dragged around inadvertently I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna add a member by the way there is a grid snap in here um, and this is probably one of the few examples of a problem where that might help but I'm not gonna do that right now because in fact you will over the course of your use of this software um, design structures where you don't even want a grid snap and whatever you're designing has nothing to do with any kind of grid snap so I'm going to show you how you can take this member you double click on that end you set all the coordinates equal to zero and that puts it that vertex is put at the origin of zero 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 now I go to the other end and I'm going to put a zero for X and Z and one for Y Y is up and I end up with a member that looks like that now I'm going to select that member uh, and I'm going to extrude the two joints that we have so far um, to produce two more members um, I can select those joints individually by holding the control key and lassoing in that direction if I lasso in the other direction by the way I get the whole member again in our case it doesn't make any difference though because as long as I've selected that member I've selected both the joints at each end and so when I go to an extrude function it will extrude those two joints and it kind of ignores the fact that I've also selected the member because it doesn't know how to it doesn't have a a way of extruding a member it only extrudes joint joints so I'm going to go here and I'm going to go down and hit extrude and I'm sorry you can't see that but you'll see it uh, in your on your screen down near the bottom it says extrude and now I'm going to extrude it one foot in the X direction and it looks something like this now I'm going to come here and pick this and snap to these joints and I could have just duplicated that member right there but it was about as easy to do this now I'm going to lasso to the le left and you'll notice I'm selecting whatever it surrounds plus whatever it touches I don't want to select all of that because if I did that and then I said duplicate which is what I want to do and I want to duplicate it one foot in the X direction I hit OK it says you cannot copy members on top of existing members so what it's trying to do is it's trying to duplicate that member on top of that which is not what we want um, multi-frame does not know how to have two members occupying the same space at the same time and it basically refuses to do that so I'm going to take my lasso function I'm going to grab those three and I'm going to hit duplicate and now I'm going to duplicate it one foot in the X direction and I'm going to do it 23 times and I end up with that so my truss if I hit control T which means control total which by one of the reasons I love multi-frame is to do that in AutoCAD you have to hit Z return E return all I have to do is hit control total and it basically sizes the window to show me the total structure control T is that keyboard command so I hear, here I have the 24 square bays now I want you to notice something when I go to rotate it's going to rotate this structure about uh, the origin and so it's annoying that the structure wanders out of my field of view so I'm going to set that right there and I'm going to hit control all which selects every member now I'm going to go to geometry and you don't see it but down on your um, your uh, menu bar you'll see the, the, the function move so you're going to click on move and now we're going to move it minus 12 in the X direction and then I'm going to hit control T again to show me the total structure and now when I go to rotate this structure it's better behaved it doesn't wander off of my screen basically 
Okay, so now I have my 24 bays, and I want to do a member right here. So I snap there. Then I'm going to select that, and I'm going to go to Duplicate. You don't see it, but you'll see it on your screen. On this menu, it says Duplicate. And I'm going to say X direction, and I'm going to go five times. And now I'm going to draw a member right here. And I'm going to say Duplicate. And it's going to go five times again in the X direction. And now there are a number of different things I can do here. I could just go and delete this half of the truss. And then I can lasso the members to the left here. And I can go mirror. And I'm going to mirror about X. And I better say duplicate. Otherwise, it'll just flip those members over. And now I have my complete truss. Okay, so there are a number of different ways we can handle all this. But one of the things we know for sure is we want all these members to be uh, moment relieved at the ends. So one of the things I could do is I could select all here, control all, and I could go pick right here, pin joints everywhere. If I do that, the computer will come back and say the solution makes no sense. Um, and it'll say there are too many unrestrained degrees of freedom. So what, what, is, what the computer program is really saying is, if all those are pin joints in every direction, this thing is just immediately going to collapse. It has no source of stability. So we don't want to do that. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to start off saying that we want to do member releases. So here we have joint releases where we can stop rotation or torsion about the member. Uh, we're not going to have any torsion in the structure, and we don't want to we don't want to release anything we don't have to uh, in order to do our analysis. So we're going to leave it that way. The members uh, about the y-axis, which is the vertical axis for the local coordinates of the member, we don't want to relieve those because they're not crucial. But what we do have to do is we have to release the moments about the z-axis uh, in order to assure that these things are acting like true pin joints, except we're going to call them hinge joints. Because remember, a hinge can have a moment capacity in one direction, but a pin joint in another. And so that so-called hinge joint will give us the freedom we want to let these members rotate freely about the Z prime axis. So we're going to click OK. Then we're going to come along and we're going to put our restraints. So we can go here and we can pick a full moment restraint. Um, and for the moment, there are several ways to do this. So for the moment, I'm going to pick that. And now when we go look at frame, um, I think I still have a point selected. No. So I'm going to go to um, Joint Restraint. It's now telling me I have restrained X, Y, Z, rotation about the X axis, rotation about the Y axis, and rotation about the Z axis. What I said was I want to free up that rotation. And so that's what I'm going to do. And now I'm going to come here, and rather than go over there and pick one of these, which is not even what I want, I'm going to go straight to Frame, Joint Restraint, and I'm going to pick Y, Z, Theta X, and Theta Y. So remember, I'm always allowing rotation about the Z axis. I'm never allowing it to flop over, nor am I allowing it to wag about. I have to support it against Y, otherwise it will collapse under the loads I'm going to put on it. I'm going to constrain it against Z prime because, again, I don't want the structure swinging around the Y axis, but I'm not going to restrain X because then my supports 
will be interfering with the proper action of the bottom cord of this truss. So I'm going to click OK. Now the one last thing that I think I need to do, if I remember correctly, is I need to select all these members and give them a section. And again, I reiterate, we don't care what that section is. Um, we could make it something monster huge or something tiny. I'm going to make it something tiny simply because um, I know that uh, if it's a steel member and the forces that we're going to be looking at are fairly modest, um, it won't be ridiculous. So um, we're going to try to not be ridiculous, although it's fine with the computer if we are. We could put huge heavy sections there. We're not going to analyze it under its self weight anyway, so it won't care. But we're going to go up here and we're either going to pick the section library, which is right there, or we can also get to the sections library here. And the reason I like to always go there is that if I've already input a bunch of members to uh, the structure, it will list all those members plus the library. And it'll say, you can pick one of the members you've already picked, or you can go to the library and pick something new. Uh, we haven't picked anything yet, but I want to show you that capability. So here we're in uh, wide flange sections. That's what W group is. Here we're looking at a monster huge 44 inch deep by 335 pound per linear foot member. We're clearly not going to use that for a truss that's uh, only 12 inches deep. We don't want a 44 inch member. The members on the top and bottom cord, for example, would merge into each other. So we're going to just come down here for pipe and we're going to pick three quarter inch and we're going to click OK. So now we have a structure. Excuse me, let me go back. And I can render that structure if I want to. I can go click here and you'll see those seem like pretty sensible member sizes. Again, though, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, in this case because we're not sizing the members. We're just going to calculate the forces in them Eventually we will get around to sizing things by the way. So for the moment I'm going to do the following I'm going to let this structure sit here and and it's it's defined at this point and now we're going to go to the load case and in this case I can't grab and move members anyway, so I can just do this frontal view hit control T and now I'm going to apply some forces. And in your assignment, by the way, I put a P force on every joint except the end joints on the top where I put a half a P force. Um, Multiframe doesn't know what P is, but it puts all its forces in and kips. So we're just going to put in a kip instead of a P and we'll proceed to do the analysis and get our results. So. We're going to go to load and we're going to go to global joint load and you'll notice it comes up default one kip and it comes up default a downward force. I could pick something else if I want to look at wind suction or if I wanted to look at some kind of horizontal force I can pick that. But right now I'm just looking at gravity forces so I'm going to leave this default the way it is. I'm going to leave that default the way it is and now I have a one kip force on each of those joints. And now I'm going to come and I'm going to lasso that and I'm going to hold my shift key. And by the way, in multi-frame, if you want to keep selecting things, you have to hold the shift key. The default condition under AutoCAD is once something's selected, you can just keep selecting things and you don't have to hold down the shift key. The problem with that is I have discovered I can move my screen or pan over and forget that something is selected and then I'll end up deleting a huge part of my structure that I never wanted deleted. So. I like the multi-frame system where you have to keep holding the shift key down to keep selecting multiple members. So that's what I did. I held the shift key, I lassoed that, I held the shift key, I lassoed that. And now I'm going to go put in a load. I'll go to global joint load again and I'm going to put 0.5 kips and again it's down. And now if I want to see what those look like I can toggle it on. I see I have 0.5, it's a two end joints and one kip at all the interior joints. So now I'm going to toggle that off. And now I'm going to go analyze linear. And now it says the structure has unrestrained degrees of freedom. So check the members with releases. 
So I sometimes find myself, um, I'm going to hit yes here, but I don't think it's going to allow me to do it. I sometimes find myself sort of by trial and error weaving my way through this, but I have clearly released more than I have to release. For example, every member in here um, is coming into this joint with full release at the end and I've released this joint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, you know, with all the releases I've got, I can pick all these vertical members and not release them at all. And it won't change the analysis because um, all the other members framing into those vertical members are not transmitting across any moment. And so I'm just arbitrarily going to try this. I'm going to go select and I'm going to try member slope. And again, I'm sorry, this is not on here, but you go to member slope and you pick vertical and it selects all those members. And now I'm going to go look at the member releases and I'm going to turn these off to see if that helps. And now I'm going to go analyze linear and it works. <clears throat> and now I'm going to go to the plot window and I'm going to look at it frontally and I'm going to hit control T to get it fully into the field of view and by the way you'll notice right here it says it's come up under MZ prime you don't see any flags that's a good sign you click this and it says zero everywhere which is also a good sign because it says in terms of the analysis we're doing multi-frame is verifying for us that there is no moment in any of those members and that means they are effectively two force members. So I'm going to turn that off <clears throat> and now I want to go look at something different like I could go here and I could click on this axial force and I get something that looks like that. What I don't like, there are a bunch of things I don't like about this but one of them is that tension force and compression force are treated with the same color flags. <clears throat> so it's failing to take advantage of color is one of the nice features of this program. Um, so what I'm going to do here, to, though, just to help you understand what we're looking at, is I'm going to go to display, plot, and I'm going to put this at 0.2 for the scale, which is merely scaling down those flags so they're not lying on top of each other and interfering with each other. Um, in this program, a compression flag is shown on the top of the member. So we can see that the members here are in compression. A tension flag is shown on the bottom, and here we can see the members in the top corner in tension. That's all consistent with what we expect. I would like to do a couple of things to dress up this image so it better represents things. Uh, and one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to give different colors to uh, compression flags versus tension flags. And the way I'm going to do that is go to Display, Member Actions, and you'll see here it says Axial Compression. And now I'm having the same problem all over again that these flags are on top of each other. But at this point, I'm going to go to Display, Plot, and I'm going to click point 0.2. And now I scaled down my compression. But because I'm in the compression window, it didn't automatically scale down the tension. So I have two things I want to do here. One is I want to go to um, this custom plot and point something out. In your software at this point, you are probably only seeing the yellow compression flags. The reason I'm seeing cyan flags for tension and yellow for compression is I went in here under custom plot and I clicked axial tension, which means I'm also um, displaying on this plot the axial tension force. So that's how I got to have this image and you'll have to do that on your software. So now I've got this axial tension in the cyan color 
and I want to go adjust it. And in order to do that, I have to go to display, member actions, axial tension. And now you don't see any difference because it's also displaying the compression. But what I can do with it now has changed. In the previous window that was looking at axial compression, I was able to scale the yellow flags for compression. Now I can scale the cyan flags by coming to plot and changing the scale to 0.2. And now I'm seeing um, similar scales to these two things. Now, actually, I think, sadly, and this is a little frustrating, um, the scale of these two things is making the flag the maximum uh, tension flag is the same size as the maximum compression flag so unfortunately this means if we were going to make this look really right where the tension forces are lower than the compression forces which we know there are because we already analyzed that case if we were going to do that we would need to um, go and adjust uh, the scaling factor for the tension flags um, to be to produce flags that are smaller in proper proportion to the proportion of the tension flags the tension force to the compression force right for the moment I don't want to bother doing that but what the heck I'm going to do the following I want to go to this plot and I'm going to make this 0.15 just to get across that somehow these tension flags are a little smaller. And now I'm going to do something else. I'm going to go back to my display window and I'm going to look at axial compression. And now there's something interesting. I, I really don't like it when these flags are tending to go towards each other because if they get bigger, they overlap. It's very confusing. But the other thing is the biggest forces in the cord members are right around here and right around here. And if I'm going to do something graphically, I would like that graphic technique to sort of point towards what we understand, which is that... Um, we want everything to look bigger here. And we want everything to look bigger here. So it'd be great if these tension flags were on the top and these compression flags are on the bottom because then they almost point to how the depth of the structure might want to change in order to make the structure more efficient. So I'm going to go back here to this window and I'm going to lasso to the right so I only select what I've surrounded as opposed to what I've touched. And I'm going to go pick this. And now I do something where I go say uh, member orientation. And I'm going to flip those members over by typing in 180 degrees. And now I go back to my plot window and you'll notice there's nothing there. And that's because every time I make a change, multi-frame insists that I ask it to analyze again. It doesn't automatically analyze. And by the way, that's incredibly important. If this was an incredibly complicated structure, it might take 20 or 30 minutes to analyze. And if it automatically analyzed, it would mean every time I change a member, I'd be in a 20 minute do loop while it goes off and does that analysis. So this is good. I'm gonna go analyze linear. And by the way, there's a non-linear here. Uh, we will almost never be doing that, but at some point we'll talk about what that means. All right, so now, I have flipped all the flags because I have flipped all the members. And so the visual effect here is that this is suggesting that something big is happening here and that maybe this is where we would even want to make the truss deeper as a way of using the lever arm between the top and bottom cord as a way of compensating for the fact that the forces in those members are much larger at that point because the moment over the uh, support point is really large. So all of this uh, looks the way you would expect it to look uh, based on the analysis that you did, except that these flags may not be scaled exactly right to represent the relative forces that you 
uh, calculated. But they're in the ballpark, and we could make that adjustment if we want to. But also, if we want quantitative information, we go click there, and we say see that it says the maximum compression force in the bottom cord is 18 kips. The maximum tension force in the top cord is 12.5. And by the way, I'm going to... Uh, zoom in and the way i zoom by the way in this program is not z it's control w which means pick a different window for looking at it and you'll notice here there's a zero down there that zero means there's no tension so that zero is from the tension plot and here there's a zero that says well that member has got zero meaning it has zero compression but then it has a 12.5 intention uh, it would be nice if all these compression zeros disappeared and all the tension zeros disappeared um, but it's part of the plot and so we're not going to worry about it too much because we can easily figure out what it means we clearly have a non-zero tensile force in this member so we can ignore that zero okay so i'm going to turn all that off i'm going to hit Control t to give me the total view again so now I've analyzed this and I got the results that we were supposed to get. And now I'm going to go back to my window here and I'm going to take this whole truss and I'm going to duplicate it up. So I go geometry, duplicate, and I'm going to put a zero right there and I'm going to put six feet there and I'm going to put one time and I click OK, and that's the truss I just analyzed. Now, this thing down here, I'm going to actually um, increase the number of bays in it by five. So I'm going to zoom outward a little bit, and I'm going to, and there's a bunch of different ways I can do this. Uh, for right now, though, I'm going to. Uh, do this. I'm going to lasso all of those and hold my shift key and unlasso those. And then I'll hit delete. And now I've moved out. Uh, I've put a gap in there. So I'm going to move all of this. And there's, of course, a million different ways to do this. But I'm going to move this. Geometry move minus 2.5. And then I'm going to move this geometry move plus 2.5. And now I need to fill in the gap here. So I'm going to lasso all of this. And I'm going to, excuse me, I'm going to lasso all of that. And I'm going to duplicate it. Geometry. Duplicate. And I'm going to go two feet to the right. One time. And I get that. Then I'm going to lasso all of this. And I'm going to duplicate. Minus three. Whoa. Oh, I threw a bay away. Um, so I'm going to do this. Geometry. Duplicate. Minus one. And I end up there. So... This is the truss, except for one problem. Um, all these webs were inverted. So I'm going to take all of this, and I'm going to move it down. Or, it doesn't make any difference. I can just take this. I'm going to go to Geometry, Move. I'm going to put 0 and minus 0.5. And the reason I'm going to do that is I want to flip the truss uh, about y. So in other words, I want to take plus y to minus y and minus y to plus y. And uh, so I'll take all this and I will say mirror. 
So I go to geometry, mirror. I'm going to mirror about Y. And now I'm going to click off duplicate because I just want to flip the truss. I don't want to duplicate it while I'm doing that. So I'm going to flip that off. And now I have the truss geometry. And there's only a few problems left. One is this joint is not the support joint anymore. So I'm going to negate all the restraints there. And I'm going to negate all the restraints there. And then I'm going to pick this point and I'm going to go put in member, uh, excuse me, joint restraint. I'm going to pick X, Y, Z, theta X and theta Y. And likewise, I'm going to go to this joint. And just like I did before, I'm going to put Y, Z, theta X and theta Y. And I remind you, to get the proper rotation as pin joints, we have to release the rotation about Z. We have to release X so the restraint is not providing some kind of buttressing action. And that's why we do all of that. And now I have to go to my load windows, and you'll notice now the screwy situation where all these forces are no longer relevant. So I'm going to um, go to load. And up above, you don't see it, but there's an unload joint option. So I click on that. And now I remember this was set to 0.5. So I'm going to go select these two. And I'm going to go to global joint load. And it's 0.5 and it's down. So that's what I want. And now I'm going to go select all these joints. I'll go to global joint load. And now I'm going to make this one. And now just to check myself, I'm going to turn this on and I have all the loads the way that I want them. And now I should be able to analyze this. And uh, all right, so this message, let me go over this message. For whatever reason, this computer will not, within a single file, analyze two completely separate and distinct structures. And I'm not quite sure why it's set up that way, but it has some way of tracing through the entire system from one member to every other member. And when we provide an interruption like this, it just throws up its hands and says, we give up. So. What's required of us is that we connect these two trusses together. And we're going to do that in the following way. Um, I may have closed too many windows here. Let me just see something. Ooh, that's interesting. So, huh. okay, so I was just having a momentary mental lapse where I basically was making the classic mistake of trying to input a member, but right now I'm in the load window. I cannot input members in the load window. I can only put them in the frame window, so I go there. And I want to add a member. And here's my member addition tool. So I click on that. And now the key thing is I want to connect together a point on the bottom truss that's very stable and doesn't move to a point on the top truss that's very stable and doesn't move because that's how I make sure that whatever member I'm putting in there is not affecting the behavior of either of those trusses. So I'm going to go from a support point here to that support point there. This member, by the way, I'm going to make something small, like a P3 tube. And then to make sure that it's not exerting any moment on anything there, I'm also going to go to the frame window, and I'm going to pick member releases, and I'm going to release these uh, Z moments so that there's no way that member can be affecting anything. So right now, the only effect that member has is that it will increase the reactions. 
if we were doing a self-weight analysis, it would increase slightly the reactions at those two points because the computer will account for the self-weight of that little tiny member I put in there. Um, but we're not being concerned with self-weight at this point. We're not analyzing that. We're just analyzing the structure under all these 1K point forces that we're putting on the top. The other thing you do have to be worried about is this member, um, if it's long and tiny, it can deform a lot under its own self-weight. So if we were accounting for self-weight and we were trying to look at deflection of the structure, that member might be deflecting so much that you can't see the deflections uh, or the, other, the deflections of the rest of the structure are so small by comparison that they sort of uh, are played down in the graphic display. Um, one way to get around this is to make this member out of some material that has zero mass. Um, you have to be a little careful because the program sort of gets disturbed when you introduce a material with zero weight, but it can be done. But for the time being, we're not going to worry about that because this member is not bothering us at all. And if it bothers you visually, by the way, you can go up here and you can uh, mask out selection. Sorry, you can't see that. And then you can go to view and you can pick masking and go to mask invisible. And now that member has completely disappeared. So we are now in a position where I think we can analyze this linear. And now we're going to go to um, display member actions, axial tension. And we don't get a response. And the reason we don't get a response is we're in the wrong window. So we're going to go to this window. And now we have this weird situation where this truss got flipped over. And there are some strange things happening to it. So we're going to do the following. We're going to um, erase all of that. So I'm going to back, whoa, again, I'm in the wrong window to do that. And this is, so we got to remember a few things here. First of all, let's just flip this one member, or in fact, we'll go flip those four members. Um, Let's go do that. We'll flip those four members. So we're going to come here. I'm going to select those four members. No, four. And now we're going to come up here to frame member orientation. We're going to set those to zero and we'll click OK. Now we have to analyze again. That was a trivial change, but it still forces us to do that. So now we've got. Um, this compression on the top shown on the top of the member, the, comp the tension on the bottom shown on the bottom of the member. But now we have to go for all of these members. So there are eight of these and eight of those. We have to flip those. And then we're going to flip seven on the bottom. So let's see if we can remember all of that. We're going to select these. Seven on the top. Excuse me, eight on the top. Am I remembering that correctly? Sorry. I'm going to go back here. Yes, eight on the top, seven on the bottom. And by the way, all of this is like obsessive compulsive by some people's book because I'm just worried about making it look good. Uh, but we're all architects, so we all kind of understand that. We're going to go to the member orientation. We're going to flip it to 180. We're going to click OK. We're going to do the analysis. And then we're going to go to the frame window here. And now we have this really well-behaved structure. By the way, I want you to notice that the diagonals up above are all in tension. The diagonals in the bottom are all in compression, which is what we expected. 
And we can also toggle on uh, this plot. And you see we get the 18 above here and 18 below there. And look at the balance that we got. We have 18 here and 18 there. So this is a manifestation of the fact that we have the optimal cantilever for this particular truss. Okay, so for your assignment, I'm going to ask that you mock all this up just the way I did. Go through all the steps to make sure that you understand it. And I would like for you to submit your multi-frame file um, so that I can pull up this particular image and understand that the analysis has been done correctly. So that ends our video on the 24 square bay truss with the six bay cantilevers and the 29 square bay truss with two six bay cantilevers each solved on multi-frame.